Um, we thought it might be helpful just to start um, sort of with a bit of background as to how Charlie and I met, which was about ten, just over ten years ago. And oddly enough, it was not so much through Charlie's work as an artist, um, but um, initially through um, Charlie's writing, because at the time um, we were doing sort of quite a few different reviews, or sort of reviewing um, say positions exactly, because they were sort of quite interesting online platforms in the main um, around kind of the languages of abstraction, geometric composition systems, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think when we first met I was writing for Abstract Critical mm -hmm. and Saturation Point, both of which were like online art journals that specialised in, in writing particularly about contemporary and modern abstraction. And I've done some writing for Terps as well, mm -hmm. which is an imprint magazine where painters write about painting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think we, we probably met in the context of that because probably some of the artists whose work I was writing about would be the type of artists that you were showing in your gallery. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember particularly because um, at the time I had, I think, just taken on quite an elderly artist for... My space, generally speaking, s certainly started out with a view to try and support young and emerging artists and kind of over time some of them got older but still has that bent to be trying to show new work. But we'd taken on um, an elderly artist at that point, Natalie Dower, who came out of... Um, the sort of periphery of the British systems constructivist um, school and I, I can remember that it was actually very helpful meeting you because I think that um, as each generation sort of tends to get locked in their own um, immediate um, kind of connections and environment, what, what was great was that um, you were one of the younger artists, I think, that um, kind of in your work and in the kinds of curatorial things you were doing and also sort of the kind of people you were writing about, that a sort of re-examination of um, maybe an older language of um, systems, geometric abstraction, and coming at it with a very, very different viewpoint, mm. I think, than the older artists that I knew. Um, and somebody like Natalie had sort of suffered from never having been kind of conventional enough mm. to sit easily in that sort of group of artists. So um, it was very interesting then going from me to you to looking at your work because it was obviously embracing some of that mm. language but doing it in a very contemporary way. Well I'm, I mean I've always been really interested and inspired by that kind of the legacy of particularly that high modernist language in painting and I'm especially drawn to very like strong graphic sort of systems based or geometric painting in particular but I think from the generation that I come from, looking at it in isolation as a just painting for painting's sake, which I think is kind of quite, a, if I dare say, slightly old-fashioned now, an outdated way to look at abstraction. For me, that always felt like quite an alien position, and it was quite hard for me to disconnect painting practices to just visual culture in general. And as someone that's grown up and seen the evolution of like the internet and home computing, there's so much crossover in language between a lot of that kind of systems-based stuff and notions of digital systems and programming. And I always looked at systems-based mm. painting as sort of analogue programming. And I'm really fascinated in that kind of relationship between the very physical world of painting and something that exists much more virtually that you can't touch, that isn't sort of tangible in the same way and that exists on a screen. You know, and as a child I sort of grew up watching loads of TV playing computer games and I can remember like you know the early sort of 
dawnings of like home computing mm. and doing little bits of bit really basic programming and generating sort of images on a screen that actually really resonated and look whether I went to art school became very familiar when I found artists like Natalie mm. and other systems based or geometric abstract painters. For me the, the two sort of languages are very much enmeshed and I'm fascinated with what happens at the edges of those definitions of abstraction where the kind of the once radical nature of it sort of dissipates and it becomes much more everyday. Well I think even in the 10 years since we met I mean it's very interesting and I've been looking back recently actually further back because um, been sorting through the gallery's archive that has been a very good moment to actually kind of look back actually 30 years um, in the eagle space yeah. and how um, one of the things that's been very interesting is how when I started the gallery and even 10 years ago I would say that some of the sort of um, categories of or categorizations of practice mm -hmm. and um, very definitive statements about certain things like what painting is or isn't that um, that actually the last 10 years has has kind of really broken down so many different barriers a lot to mm -hmm. do I think with technology yeah. um, and that um, what's been interesting to me about your work is that uh, as an artist watching it straddle um, something that is still very analogue and mm. to do with uh, a, a kind of necessary response to physical objects that, that can't be put across as sort of satisfactorily in the way that it's made on screen, but how you've um, used, I think you've been very dexterous watching from a kind of objective point of view, um, various ways of being able to make public your work I think mm. is actually really what it is but in a number of different directions and one of the things that um, I, I just wanted to ask you about really was that you did a very interesting and I think quite important um, commission for ITV sort of tail end of 2018. Yeah. Um, um, I wondered if you would talk a bit about that, because I think you were one of, was it 52 artists that were eventually shown, but yeah. from a wider body of artists who were commissioned yeah. for that? So in so late 2018, ITV started to contact artists about a project called ITV Create which they hoped were able to commission a different artist for every week of the year in 2019 to reimagine their television identity. So the, the, the brand of ITV would, was hopefully going to be like reconfigured by different artists. Mm -hmm. So there would be 52 different versions of the ITV logo that would be played in between all their programming on all their uh, TV and internet channels. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it's, I think it's an actually really exciting project. They were commissioning you know, fine artists to make something that in the past graphic designers would have been making. And for me that was, um, it actually kind of supported loads of ideas I had about the position of artists post things like Instagram as well. Mm -hmm. That actually those traditional boundaries of disciplines don't exist anymore to the people that are commissioning you to make work. I think these days artists are competing with graphic designers, illustrators, street artists, and vice versa. We're all sort of looking for the same marketplace or the same audience in a way. When people are scrolling through Instagram and some curators curate purely through looking mm -hmm. through social media, they're not looking at who you are or where your practice is rooted. They're immediately looking for a very quick visual hit. And then if they're interested, they'll find out more about a bigger context. And so for me, for ITV to, uh, like I said, sort of massive sort of national Sort of institution to be supporting that idea that actually fine artists who would conventionally be working within a gallery context could show and disseminate work in a in a much more kind of populist culture was really exciting for me. 
Um, so I was approached to do that on the basis of another project that I'd done in Coventry as part of the first Coventry Biennial of Contemporary Art in 2018, where I'd made um, a sort of a walk-in painting. So I'd, uh, I'd been given a, a, a physical room within a, a, a decommissioned newspaper factory and its offices to make something that people could walk into. So I'd done a painting on the wall, some old painted objects on the floor, and some more traditional paintings on canvas. So it was like a painting as installation. And I was always very interested in this idea of what happens at the edges of the, the canvas. So when painting doesn't just exist as something that's pictorial and put on the wall, how can it be experienced as something that's a much more immersive you know, experience for people? And I am very passionate in thinking about how the legacy of painting can be continued to be developed away from the canvas, but without losing the integrity of the painting itself. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was also a really exciting opportunity to explore some of those things. And Charlie Levine, who is the curator of the ITV Curator Project, had seen that installation and contacted me to say, we're looking to commission some artists, preferably sculptors, but we really like what you've done in Coventry. Is there a way that you could come up with some proposals for how you could also make something that would reimagine the ITV logo as something that would be seen you know, on screen? And, I'm, you know, and I was very excited to do that. Well, I think it was a very rich... I mean, I, I saw quite a few mm. of them, and I think, I think that what, what, what is so interesting, I'd say, about the last sort of period, where I think that these boundaries between disciplines have broken down, practice, you know, I think that um, it's no longer the case that a painter is just a painter, or I mean, I think I think that the bleed between actual physical practices, or whether they're physical or digital or whatever, but also I think the role the artist has now, as well in the promotion mm. of their work, is quite different to how it was, say, twenty-five, thirty years ago. Um, and I think that, um, and I think in, in art schools, my impression now, having been initially of a generation of er early days of people that were <coughs> like teaching things like professional practice, very early days, which were, I think, was very necessary because when I started teaching, I mean, pe people going through art school were just sort of thrown out with absolutely mm. no sense of how to negotiate, um, you know, making their work public in any way at all. Um, but that there's a sort of cycle that's gone round now where, in a sense now, art school seems to be as much about creating professionalised mm -hmm. artists and, and less to do with the substance and the thought yeah. within the work itself. So this kind of balancing of um, the exposure of work, which mm. is really what I think everybody involved in, <laughs> in um, you know, in the art world really wants to do is to communicate, you know, the work, what, what it's about, what mm. the artist is excited by. Um, I was just wondering, it just occurred to me, is that, have you noticed the shift then, as a curator or a gallerist working with artists, have you noticed a change in how artists are maybe presenting themselves and their work to you? Oh, def definitely. I mean, I think, gener I think generationally you, you see immense... Um, Differences, and I think each generation has to contend, in a sense, with the th with the sort of circumstances of what their generation is presented with. And I think that having worked in the past with, you know, now either much older or, or dead artists who were coming out of a period where, um, say, to do with abstraction, the kind of uh, dominating um, philosophy around abstraction when I started working was uh, the, the sort of American abstract mm. expressionist um, 
and you know surprisingly late on um absolutely was the sort of um primary way that people were being expected or required mm. to 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 look at that so and people who didn't were very much kind of um out in the cold um and how that for example when i started the eagle which was in 1991 at that point the sort of prevailing tendency was very much kind of leading into the conceptual mm -hmm. and i was categorically told by different um kind of establishment figures that I should not be showing painting, did I not realise that painting was completely redundant and finished and um, and that the gallery would not succeed or survive if I if I carried on doing this terribly unfashionable thing. And I think in relation to say the difference between you, you know, younger artists coming now to present work, you know, with, with the view to wanting to show. I mean, they have got entire proposals sorted mm -hmm. out and um, statements written and um, concepts of, you know, what they want the show to be like and whatever. But um, my my feeling is, and this is this is just a this is a generalisation mm. that um, partly because there's less practice based um, possibility now mm. in um, art colleges that the way that people find out through making that I still feel this my observation is a very important part of any artist process and that kind of negotiation of things like things going wrong mm. um, which they do um, that I'm not seeing that much work that really fires me up and I think the kind of sense that um, you know a gallery may not be looking for a finished product I don't think what a gallery is looking for is something that's interesting mm. and particular and um, not different because I don't think you can have totally different but you want something that you uh, feel is very particular that um, you maybe haven't seen in that, mm. that way before um, and I think that comes from, I don't think that comes from writing um, remits about what the work is going to be like. I think that's the difference, I think. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's a generational thing because of how people are being taught, taught which is difficult because um, in the same way I think that, that now to be an artist, say, going into something like teaching, which used to be absolutely the way that a lot of practising artists mm -hmm. would support themselves, you know, you've now got to have a PhD virtually to get foot in the door with the teaching role. And again, in a way, while art schools were quite haphazard <laughs> in the past, and some of the teaching practices of people that were actually very good teachers mm. but would actually be really beyond the pale today but um, but where a chance observation of something that had been acutely observed mm. in an older practicing artist to a younger one could give that younger person not necessarily an entire explanation of what they should be doing, but could take them down a route that um, might be actually a very productive one. Because yeah. I think that sense of, I see that going places like Terps Painting mm. School, I do think peer, um, 
I, I think it's very valuable actually to have um, other artists kind of involved looking at, at, um, mm. at work. Well, I think there's an increasing number of these sort of alternative art schools and I think that's really good actually mm. because I think they're picking up on things that have evolved over time in more sort of like conventional arts institutions and things like you're talking about that, that shift away from the importance of just being in a studio making stuff and getting you know conversation and debate around it from your peers and from established artists who might be teaching you. Mm -hmm. I think those days have probably gone for a lot of big universities that are running arts degrees. There's some, still some smaller, more independent art schools where I think that culture exists, mm. but it's also important to look at why these alternative spaces are popping up more and more regularly, I think. I think Terps is really good, actually, as an mm. example of how painting education can kind of be remixed to work in the contemporary world. And it's being taken more seriously now, even though it's like uncredited with a sort of academic qualification. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's good to see that it's kind of risen over and above that as a problem. Artists are going there to just paint and be around people and have access to really good feedback and mentoring without mm. the, the need to have a piece of paper at the end of it. Yeah. Well, because you, you in your work, I think, have actually um, developed and balanced very, very successfully, it seems to me, um, kind of using what's out there in terms of sort of platforms that you can put the work out there um, and make it accessible. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I mean, I think we'll, we'll kind of talk a bit later mm -hmm. about how that's kind of come actually into your work in, in terms of actually how it's changed to a degree the actual work that you make, but um, uh, I, I wanted to talk to you a bit, I suppose, about how you view um, the, how technological change has been the sort of most absolutely radical shift, certainly, certainly in my working mm. life. I mean, my, my gallery goes absolutely over from the analogue to the digital um, age and it's reflected in um, so many different aspects when I look back that, that um, early days when um, Clerkenwell still had the remnants of the kind of print trade on the mm. doorstep that um, the cheapest way actually of printing small run books, for example, was to do it uh, sort of letterpress. Um, and um, that was literally making use of the printers that were on the doorstep, which now would be probably the most expensive yeah. way of being able to make the same thing. And now I can kind of do, you know, five digital catalogues if I feel like it. So, and the whole way that um, in initially, the, again, thinking of just sort of having these thoughts about terps going back to actually a very traditional way of doing something, but with the kind of contemporary cast mm. on it, that um, I've found recently um, balancing, for example, having the joys of being able to sort of do a mailing on a MailChimp, but then countering that sort of, oh no, not another invitation <laughs> coming from these people, <laughs> but actually going back to also having physical cards or a catalogue or a publication so that, because I'm finding that while people are so saturated with information, mm. um, that sometimes just going, right, this is really interesting. I'm going to put something in an envelope and yeah. send it to you so that it's sat on your desk telling you that, that yeah. it's interesting, has value, and that one's beginning now to put all of these things in the pot to, to 
you know, try and get get to everybody. Really, yeah. I suppose. Well, I think we've got to the point now with technologies where it's very easy to ignore them. <laughs> like, you know, we, we all have so many emails now, it's much easier not to read mm -hmm. any of them. So I think getting to the point where you can pick and choose and make conscious decisions about the best way to communicate things about whatever you're doing, it's a really exciting place to be. And yeah, just going back to like that, that massive shift in terms of accelerated technological development over the last, say, 30, 40 years even. You know, those of us that can remember the world without the internet. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're ever going to have a point in like contemporary history like that ever again. That mm -hmm. massive shift. You know, I can't imagine, I mean, maybe there will be. I mean, I, I won't be the person that imagines it if there isn't another massive technological shift. But... That's, it's really significant. We're, we're one generation that's ever going to have experienced that analogue to digital transition. Mm -hmm. it's an, it, that's an incredible point to have been alive. And so kind of just looking at that and looking at what it offers and how we can use it, particularly if we're not necessarily technological people, you know. Which you say you are. Which <laughs> no, it doesn't appear yeah. to, which it doesn't appear so from um, kind of... Um, so, you know, because so, you're moving more, well, some of some of what you're doing now is moving kind of into the territory of sort of augmented reality yeah. and film, film and um, all sorts of things, actually. That you I think I'm doing. fascinated in technology. I don't mm. necessarily understand it or think I know how to use it well. Mm -hmm. It's still, I still find it quite difficult and stressful to learn how to do things. I don't understand the logic behind it quite often. Like digital logic is very different to the logic that you have in the studio as a painter, mm -hmm. where you feel your way f through things, and yeah, things go wrong, but you can still make it work. If things go wrong when you're using a piece of software, you can't really make it work, it's just gone wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're very different things, but I just, I suppose I like using technology in the way that I do paint, and I just use it for bits and pieces to explore the parameters of painting. I'm, I'm, everything I do, even if I'm working with augmented reality, which is something quite new that I'm working on at the moment, that still comes from me exploring my painting language and pushing it away from the canvas, mm. or seeing how that would exist in three dimensions, or looking at a painting through a phone and bringing it to life. I mean, I find that stuff really exciting. I don't think I do it particularly well technologically, but I do it in a way that... It feels like I own it in the same mm -hmm. way I own the way I make a painting, which I also I know how to paint a painting in a particular way that I do. I know how to make something move on a screen in the way that I make it move. It all feels like it comes from me. I think where it starts to be a bit more, um, maybe a bit less rigorous where artists are using technology is where they're being led too much by the software or by an aesthetic mm -hmm. that that is, becomes very familiar. Mm -hmm. And if you spend you know enough time on things like Instagram, you see artists that are making work using particular software, and you're like, oh, I don't know how they've done that, and they know how they've done that, uh -huh. but what they're doing with it isn't very interesting. Yeah. It might look very slick and you know, glossy and cool, but actually, I always think, how does that relate back to your own practice, or the, the context around the work you're making, or the integrity of the work, in the same way you would you know, be self-critical in the studio, how mm -hmm. you're self-critical in terms of how you're using those new technologies as well. Mm -hmm. Because that, again, I think possibly is the advantage of having... Um, I mean, I think artists will use and have done whatever, whatever new is at hand, and they'll kind of, um, in a way, uh, not necessarily use it the way that it's meant to be used, but yeah. they will find sort of interesting uses for it. Um, but the, the, what you're saying about bringing it back always to... Uh, something that is inherent to the work yeah. is is rather than the work being somehow the vehicle for something else because I think that that's what I I guess worry about in a way looking at um, the incredible pressure now though it's not just on artists I think on Kind of in a way, in, a, in in the age that we're living in now, where whether and I, and I think there will be a reaction to it. I think probably there already is of a lot of mm. people kind of going. Actually, I don't want to be on social media anymore. I'm just going to turn it all off. I don't need that sort of extra 
um, stress. <laughs> well, extra lot of information, yeah. I think it is, more than anything else, because um, I think we've been barraged by information now to the point where it's actually quite difficult to... Um, you, you know, you have to actively decide, I think, mm. to uh, turn it off, which I think my generation is actually perfectly capable of doing. Like, don't turn the phone off. Um, whereas, you, you know, younger people, it's so much a part of the way that they communicate that actually it's quite difficult mm. to, to go, yeah, I, I don't need to have my phone around. Um, but that... Um, this sense of sort of bringing ideas from everywhere into the work that you make. And I think what's interesting to me that you've, you've gone in a number of different directions and that you are still making studio-based paintings. Um, you're making, um, you've done some very, very interesting, quite large scale <coughs> commissions. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I mean, the hospital rooms, which is this very good charity for commissioning visual artists to work in me sort of mental health. Yeah, locked um, mental health, secure mental health units across the UK. And incredibly effectively, some of yeah. the commissions seem to be... To and again, be and again, they're commissioning artists that wouldn't necessarily work, A, in that kind of environment, but also would normally be working on a canvas. You mm. know, they wouldn't be working on walls or mm. making work that was for an architectural space. And I think they're, they're really good projects for artists to work on. I mean, like Hospital Rooms is an amazing charity. They do such good work. Um, and also part of the process of doing a hospital rooms project also means you have to be in the unit talking to the patients, mm -hmm. talking to the people that work there. There's always some kind of you know really good consultation with how the work you make will impact on the environment or the mental health of people that are in there. Um, and you also do workshops with the with the people the, the service users mm -hmm. as well. So you're actually part of the life of that unit that you're working in for a certain amount of time before you make the work mm -hmm. and that experience informs what you're doing and I think you know that's, that's one of the wonderful things about being an artist is you're often put into these situations that you would not normally be in. Well Wembley Stadium, yeah. can I ask you how that <laughs> came, because came, um, that was quite a fun um, thing as well wasn't it? Yeah. But, um, I've never even been to Wembley Stadium oh. until I did that. I don't know anything about football at all, nothing. Um, other than it's like a cool building that I see from the train when I'm going past it. But, um, but yeah, I was commissioned for International Women's Day last year to make an installation on um, a set of steps in front of mm. the stadium. And, um, and that, that was actually that was like a digital print that was installed on vinyl and adhered to the steps. Um, and it, it was <laughs> steps are quite a strange thing to make work for because um, obviously there are there are weird angles, so you have to consider perspective. There's lots of like formal considerations. Mm. Whereas if you're working uh, more pictorially, it's not the perspective isn't going to work. It's going to look quite strange when you're there. So there's some interesting like design problems that those projects throw up that maybe are quite different to when I work in the studio and I'm only really having to consider a rectangle or a mm. square. But I like that, and I, again, I love the idea that painting can be brought into the real world, that it isn't just on a canvas in a gallery for, you know, quite privileged people to be able to buy mm. and own, that it can be something that can be out in the real world, mm. responding, you know, kind of quite rigorously to architectural spaces and considering how that work can impact on people's daily lives. Mm. And for me, it's really important that painting has that. It lives and breathes, it lives and breathes amongst us. It's not just something that is either isolated in a studio or in a gallery. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's, I think you, as I say, I think have been very um, creative and responsive to sort of actually uh, sort of both opportunities that have mm -hmm. arisen, but that um, I think being able to. Um, Re well, you, you said something yesterday which I, I think is actually true, it's about reading the room, yeah. that, that I think is I think is something that 
you know, to, to a degree, I think that all people working in the arts, in a way, have to do all the time, because yeah. there's no, I mean, while there are curator, you know, curating courses and, I don't know, professional practice courses and whatever, uh, that are meant to train you to do certain things that, um, which they do to, to a degree, that actually, um, sometimes you can have all the right things kind of in place and then i mean for example covid uh that where one can have you know a business predicated on one thing and mm. find that circumstances change and if you're not able to rethink pretty quickly how mm. you might do it differently or um, is is there, uh, you know, another way of communicating that you haven't thought about, um, that actually you, you won't survive because I think we're in we're in yeah. a world that's, it, you know, the art, I'm talking about the art world is particularly punishing in terms of needing mm -hmm. to be always to a degree. Um, sort of moving forwards, which is not to say that the past isn't very critical yeah. as well, um, but I think that, that the need to recognise that, um, you know, this remit has changed or that yeah. remit has changed and be able to sort of respond to it. Um, but it I mean, for me, Covid changed everything. Like, I had a lot of projects and exhibitions planned for the next two years they all just disappeared overnight and then and then in a way it did me a lot of good actually that that challenge of oh my god what am i going to do now i've literally mm -hmm. got nothing ahead of me i had to start thinking about what else can i do mm -hmm. with my work where else can my work be where people can still see it mm -hmm. and you know realistically and i get paid mm -hmm. You know, actually being responsive to these situations and looking at the many opportunities that are out there to make work and show work and expand your audiences, that's a good business model. You know, mm. you, I, for me, I can't be in the studio now in a world post-COVID just making paintings and thinking someone's going to buy mm. them. Mm. That's unrealistic. It's not a sustainable business model. Mm. I'm going to not be able to pay my mortgage very soon, if that's the case. Yeah. So finding ways to reach out to different people is, is important mm. and, and I'm probably of the generation or the mindset that I can't leave my phone alone because opportunities for me are coming yeah. from the well, worlds in which I'm putting yeah. my work out into. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, work. I think that's very interesting to, you know, I think that's, it's very interesting to know because I think you got a very big Facebook commission, didn't you, from somebody seeing your work on, on, Instagram. on Instagram. Yeah. Um, which, um, and also, you, you mentioned that the consultant had also, I think, because there was a very short time frame yeah. that involved, that had also picked up from your Instagram that this was possibly somebody who could um, work to a, a deadline and think on their feet. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, and that for me was a really good testament to the power of something like social media, if you use it well or use mm. it in a way that works well for you mm. I don't think there's one way to use it mm. but yeah so I um it we were in the end of lockdown it was I think it was February 2021 you know we've been in and out and but places were still shut I think um and I got an email out of the blue one day from someone that said they were a curator at Facebook saying would I like to go and paint um something in their head, head office in um around by Warren Street and of course I was like, oh, this is one of those emails where I have to put my credit card details in at the end and like all my money disappears to some other country. But it turns out it wasn't. I, I did Google the person and they turned out to be a credible person that worked at Facebook. And yeah, um, I think basically what had happened there is the building was being refurbished and they got an artist lined up to do a painting in uh, the entrance area. Um, but they then installed some quite bright coloured lighting and the artist was going to do black and white wall painting and they, and they pulled out, they're like, it's not going to work with that kind of funky disco lighting. 
um, so Facebook were looking for someone who made work that was quite quite strong, I think, in mm -hmm. terms of its kind of visual presence. Um, and apparently because I post on social media every day, or most days, um, she assumed that I meant I was very prolific in the studio and making lots of stuff. I mean, it, I am, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It just means I'm <laughs> posting stuff every day. It doesn't mean I'm making that stuff every day. Um, but it worked in my favour because, I mean, I basically had two weeks from that initial email uh, to having a Zoom meeting with them and then uh, commissioning the London Mural Company to work with me to facilitate making quite a large scale, I think, it, I can't remember how big, that's a 20 metre mm -hmm. long painting on sort of two storeys in their head office. But yeah, I had two weeks from the initial email to us having to clean up the paint and get out of the building because it's being handed back from the contractor, so it's very, very quick turnaround. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily, I managed to do it. <laughs> but also you must, you know, you, to be able to take on something like that in that time and know where to go and know who to trust that can come and sort of, you know, can, yeah. kind of can work with you. It's, again, it's not, you can't do that with no experience. I mean, it, no, it, um, you can do it if you're probably routinely overconfident and don't think things through, which mm -hmm. is probably how I felt two days after saying yes, I'd do it and mm -hmm. realising I didn't have very long. But again, you know, I'd made a really good business connection with the London Mural Company via LinkedIn, had a meeting with them about working with them on something, then we'd gone into lockdown and, you know, nothing had happened, but then as soon as I get this almost impossible commission to do, I'm like, well, I can't just ask kind friends to be up a ladder painting with me mm -hmm. in lockdown, I've got two weeks, it's a massive war, I needed to get someone that really knew what they were doing, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, because I'd made those prior connections, mm -hmm. you know, I was able to get the job done, and that's really important. You know, no, those guys are great. You know, they I could see straight away from their profile on social media that they were really serious mm -hmm. and able to get stuff done properly. Um, but I mean, that takes work. That's also part of my work oh, as no, an artist. No, is well, finding think, out these people. No, and, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I have finally, after thirty years, found a printer that can actually take ideas from the artist book sort of side and actually knows what I'm talking about, can produce, produce um, uh, you know, commercially printed books in that way. And it has taken me 30 years to find somebody yeah. who uh, I now don't have any money to be able to sort of make, you know, make anything at the moment with him. But I think Definitely, the the sort of who one works with is very very yeah. important, um, and um, I think yeah, those kind of building up those connections to, mm. to people who really can do the job is is very important. Um, I mean, in a way, I was going to ask you about this because I think during. Uh, COVID, I mean, a lot of artists, I think, have become a bit more self-sufficient. I think mm -hmm. we still need gallerists mm -hmm. and art consultants to, to sell our work, but it also feels like we've got a bit more power than maybe we did before in terms of finding our own ways to generate money or generate mm -hmm. projects. I wonder if you got a sense of that from artists that you're working with or just um, the I think, world in general? I think, um, I mean, I, I've... I, I think that's a difficult... I mean, I've never felt really that artists are sort of really... I mean, I think in the past uh, it was true that, the, you know, the gallery system operated in, you know, for a very small number of people in a way that um, made artists, in a sense, quite vulnerable unless mm -hmm. they were sort of, you know, with... Um, I mean, a... a, a the very few galleries for the number of artists there have ever been, so it was always a very sort of small mm. pool. Um, I think artists do need galleries or, or people to work with, yeah. not necessarily galleries. Um, and I think that it's no bad thing. Um, I mean, it depends what people want, because... Um, if it's the case that somebody's happy just to make something, put it on Instagram, say this is how much it costs, don't DM me, that's, that's fine if that's what mm -hmm. they want to do. 
Um, whether that will necessarily put their work into environments where it will ever end up in a museum, or whether there's a conversation that can start with a whole other group of artists' work. It's, it's quite an isolated way of disseminating that. And I think that, again, depending on what sort of level somebody wants to work yeah. on, then um, I think the connections that can happen, and as I say, it's not necessarily galleries that although galleries tend to be a sort of hub where people are coming together in, in <coughs> those places where um, sort of things like, you know, people, writers, for example, mm. or, um, or, or technical things, you know, somebody who can really understand how to take an artist's work and translate it seamlessly into another object that will, you know, either be a massively good thing or can absolutely wreck the sense of what that person's work is. You know, that, yeah. that can be bad printing or it can be, you know, any number of, of things that I think it's always helpful to have um, people to talk to about what, what one's doing. Yeah. I, don't, I don't, I mean, not just artists, but, you know, um, that sounding out of, of you know, I, I find that incredibly important to um, talk to other people about, um, uh, you know, am I, am I getting this right? Or if I think down that route, does, am I kind of potty? Yeah. Do other people think this? That, um, and I think that, that I certainly use, I mean, I would only really probably now, um, you know, if an artist shows me work by somebody else, that's the sort of, that's the kind of input that I would definitely welcome from an artist probably more than anyone else mm. if somebody's recommending somebody to me because I know that they really know what they're talking yeah. about. Um, but, um, I mean, in relation to some of the kind of technological things that you're doing now, that um, y you are moving into um, sort of things like 3D painting, aren't you? Sort of augmented reality. Yeah. I mean, I've done a couple of projects, uh, actually uh, work on these with my partner, and um, yeah, over the last year we've been sort of delving into aspects of augmented reality and bringing paintings to life in three dimensions. So I don't know if you don't know much about augmented reality, um, it's a way to access sort of animated elements through holding your phone up to an artwork and that you can kind of see things. And it's immersive, so you can walk around these things are kind of three dimensional. Um, and I think when I first started exploring this kind of way of working, it absolutely blew my mind. It was like magic in my phone. I mean, I'm very excited by you know new bits of tech, and probably because <coughs> I don't understand them. So if I understood how it worked, I might not be that excited. I think I'm a bit like a, a kind of kid that's found like a great new toy, and it's like, God, mm. this is brilliant. Um, but I do think there's a, a, a lot of potential for um, particularly artists to use augmented reality in a way that that makes it's an artwork rather than just a kind of gimmick or something. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been used quite a lot sort of commercially for you know, sort of events-based things and sort of selling things. But um, I'm really fascinated by how that can be an extension of a sort of studio-based practice. And it's something I'd like to work on more. So how are you, I mean, are you embedding things into the actual paintings to be able to do that? To, I mean, you'll have to explain to oh, so, the idea that, so you. Um, <laughs> So you, well, you make um, a sort of, it's like a digital intervention in, so I would say, for example, I make a painting in the studio, and then I will you then use some software to then maybe recreate some motifs from the painting, either using sort of like three-dimensional software, like 3D rendering software, or 
can just kind of animate the JPEG, you know, from Photoshop, so you could like scan in an area of the painting and kind of make it into kind of a separate layer. And then at some point you can kind of make that into like an animation that will play over the top of the painting or around it. And then other people can access that through a QR code or a link that you send them. So then you would be able to scan a QR code and then you hold your phone up and the, the animation that I've created on my phone will be on your phone. Mm -hmm. And then you can see it yourself. So for example in an art fair you could have a painting mounted, you know, installed that, that people could then kind of enhance, yeah. as it were, with their phones yeah. as they're going past. Exactly, yeah. 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 So it's a way to kind of bring things to life. Mm -hmm. and, and the work I make on canvas has a lot of kind of three-dimensional illusionary space. So for me, it makes sense that I can then create things that look like actual three-dimensional objects. Mm -hmm. But again, this, it's still illusionary. They're not, you know, if you, if you put your hand through them, they disappear. Well, I, 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 I wondered, I mean, it, it, again, uh, you know, my sense is that the more you've been using sort of different kind of tools, as it were, that you're bringing mm. into your work, the actual imagery seems to me to have also changed quite a lot yeah. um, from when I first um, when I first saw your work, yeah. um, particularly in relation to colour, I mm. think. Is that, would you say that's, that's true? I think or? so. I'm not sure that was a, necessarily a, a conscious shift. Mm. I think it's part of the natural process of expanding your painting language. I mm. mean, like, 10 years is quite a long time yes, to be in the studio yeah. making new work. So I think part of that is just what I would expect mm. to do. Mm. But I think there's definitely been points, probably again in the past kind of three or four years, like around lockdown, where I couldn't get in the studio and then was making smaller works at home. And I've started to use kind of like found imagery off the internet. It's still abstract within a sense, so just sort of symbol shapes, non-objective or non-figurative mm -hmm. imagery, but mixing in kind of my own painterly marks with kind of found or familiar imagery from that I was sourcing online. Again, mm -hmm. that sort of made sense to me to find stuff that was kind of open source or mm -hmm. that kind of existed from a digital world. And I think now I would probably describe my paintings as kind of like, I don't know, like ab it's still abstract in a way, it's not representative of anything. Uh, I'm exploring where the boundaries of the recognisable or the everyday are within our encounters with abstract motifs, which would once have been appeared to be quite radical and non-pictorial, but now they're much more familiar from mm -hmm. a life lived staring at a screen. Um, I suppose I use a lot of references to maybe kind of vintage gaming uh, because for me that was uh, those kind of like early explorations when I was a, when I was a child of like home computing and video games. It's a very exciting time that kind of symbolised um, I think an excitement about the future. I think now we have a lot of cynicism about technology and are much more wary of it and see much more kind of the, the, the dangerous nature of it or the way it can impact on humanity in quite a negative way. But I think there was a point in the evolution of technology that wasn't the case. It was kind of almost like utopian. It was like this is a great future where things can... I think you must have been very young. <laughs> well, I probably was. No, I, mean, but, yeah. I, I, I think, though, that interesting, uh, in the sense that I think all technology always brings um, kind of both tremendous advantages and tremendous disadvantages. And I think that that's the interesting thing that human beings are able to invent at this sort of, uh, in this way that they invent before they kind of able to really Operate. negotiate yeah. what 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 this thing is going to actually um, do, um, and I think that um, one of the things when um, well one of the things that I found very reassuring I was watching one of the films on your website that you. Um, we're talking about how a painting um, will bring you a particular experience that is that is one that is non-verbal. Mm. It's um, you, I mean you talked about being slowed down, yeah. and that that um, I think 
that um, as, a, as a sort of antidote to the kind of um, cacophony, in a sense, of what we're having to deal with in terms of in the, you know, the information that's coming mm. at us, that um, actually that sense that as philosophies around practice change and go back and kind of get rediscovered, mm. get, get moved on, that um, that place in a way for where your work starts from in a way might actually um, make, make the um, object and the activity once again actually quite precious because mm. of, and not precious in a um, monetary way, because I think that um, one of the things that I've found l less, not, not so much to do with artists, but I've found the whole culture around Collecting has completely changed mm. since when I first started working. And while um, when I first started working in galleries, you know, you were definitely appealing to a certain demographic, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think that things like art fairs um, and actually galleries like mine, where I really wanted to be in a space where anybody could feel like they could come into the gallery and not feel that they had you know to ask permission yeah. or baggage or whatever because the art world that i started working in was very hierarchical um and actually uh it discouraged you know that it's fine if you were a collector with a checkbook but yeah. if you were you know, it felt very disbarring to 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 most people, um, and I think that's changed enormously in the last thirty years. I think many more people feel they have a right to go to mm. a gallery, uh, to go to an art fair, to have a piece of art, to buy something that they want to live with, um, and. The which which is great, I think the the idea that um, each piece of work that anybody is going to buy is a very good investment <laughs> is something that that's becoming you know is unhelpful because it's it's actually not for a start what really it's about yeah. and you're as likely to end up with a really good investment I think if you're buying with your gut instinct something by somebody that you're really interested yeah. in um, than whether somebody else has said you know that whatever it is um, is, is going to be your pension yeah um, but I think that going back to the object and the, the sense of um, while you might be able to actually create a much bigger audience for what you do, I, I think it's great that you're still attached to the idea of making, you know, one-off physical things that require people to look at them. Well, yeah, I mean, being in the studio is my happy place, that's where I would like to be mm. doing stuff all the time but I think all those sort of expanded ideas of practice that I have around the periphery of what I do they, they can't happen without me making paintings for me that's where my brain is working you know I'm developing motifs or ideas or a relationship to the painted surface that I can then take into different areas mm -hmm. where I am using maybe different materials to reach new people so I, I don't think I could do any of the stuff I do without also just having time in the studio making things and getting my hands dirty and making mistakes, like you said, and making bad paintings and then making them better. That's, that's where my brain's working, that's mm -hmm. where everything comes from. I don't think I'll ever get to a stage where I'm not doing that, I, I can't imagine that. 
And can I ask you in terms of the collectors for your work, are they, do they tend to be, um, I mean, are, are they a particular generation or are they very spread? They, I think um, I have a, a hardcore group of collectors that are predominantly guys around the kind of mid-30s to, to mid-50s age who seem to work within the tech industry mm -hmm. or within some kind of like fintech or but I think from conversations I've had with them they they all they all seem to have had like an interest in creativity or art as a youngster and then got a proper job mm -hmm. that I have some really fascinating conversations with people that you know they see my work as something that if they'd been an artist it would have been something that they might have made uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but yeah, it seems to be, in terms of the people that connect with me and talk to me about the work I'm doing, that it, it seems quite a specific demographic of people. Mm. And it's interesting, you know, they're interested in similar things to me, but they probably understand them better than I do. Mm. I'm coming mm. at them from just this kind of, you know, dilettante position of, this is interesting, I'm going to have a go at it, and it doesn't, I'm not really doing it properly, but maybe it looks cool. I actually last year sold a work to somebody who came very much young French man who'd, who'd uh, come in and he definitely worked in software yeah. development and what was interesting uh, to me was that he actually had said that he'd identified that he was missing out on something, that mm. he, he sort of he felt a lack of something and that he'd started quite um, deliberately actually kind of going, um, looking for things to go and look at, yes. which I, I thought was really interesting because um, in, you know, I'm not of that generation and I, 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 I you know, obviously I spend a fair amount of time in front of a computer, but I think that I feel quite lucky that um, actually I've got all sorts of different ways that I kind of entertain myself yeah. or, um, uh, you know, get away. I, I don't think I'd want to be, I mean, it's interesting thinking about things like NFTs that mm -hmm. in terms of a way of wanting to possess and sort of relate to an artwork, for me, an NFT would be absolutely not what I would want to have. Mm -hmm. um, I'd much rather have some lovely thing that I can kind of <laughs> look at, which... Um, I still think that the, the NFT collector is a very different person to the, the painting collector. Mm. I mean, I've had, I have done an NFT project. I did a, a drop with Rareable a couple of years ago. Um, and obviously I'd contacted some of my collectors say, hey, this, I'm thinking they'd love it. You know, they mm. work in tech, you know, it's like they're going to love this, they're going to buy it, it's going to be brilliant. Weren't interested at all because A, they don't trust cryptocurrency and yet actually they wanted a physical thing. Mm. So for me, although you think I would be really excited about the prospect of working within the NFT sphere, I've just never kind of got into it, I've never worked it out and I haven't found the right people to, to buy my work as an mm. NFT. I'm mm. sure they're out there somewhere, but mm. they're not the same people that buy paintings. No, me. I wouldn't have thought so because it's such a diff it's just such a different um, territory, really. And it's a whole world in itself to come to that when you've been working hard in another area. It is like kind of breaking into a new, like a little family or something that you mm. can't. It, it's it's very, it's quite hard work to get, penetrate that. I think mm. from the outside. Mm. It feels like hard work for me, anyway. Well, I've I'm, got enough to I do without. Know where to start. I mean, I, I've got very bemused artists that I show that are being approached by people yeah. at the moment through their Instagram accounts going, you know, have, have you got this work as an NFT? And she knows to be quite wary of those people. I'm They've sure, messaged yeah, you on Instagram yeah. as well about NFTs. Yeah. I think most of them aren't real people. No, <laughs> no, no. Well, I just don't know what they gain from it. It's, so sort of naive, really, but um, um, I was just wondering if there was yeah, I mean, cu curating as well. You you've curated shows, and um, I think we were talking 
well, we talked a number of times really about how important it is to work with other people. Yeah. Um, which I must say I've always felt, um, you know, certainly always tried to encourage students when I was mm. teaching that that's your resource really is to, is to, you know, it's quite difficult to come up with original thought over and over and over again. It's just not going to happen yeah. as soon as you get a catalyst that, that um, can be somebody else. It's, it's just a much more, um, well, I, I think, you know, what I do and I think what you do are actually quite solitary act activities yeah. in their sort of... In their essence. In their essence, you spe yeah. You, you, your thinking comes from a very quiet, solitary, reflective space, I think. And I think probably for some artists working with other people feels like quite an alien activity. I actually really like the challenge of having that negotiation or compromise around other people and their ideas mm. in order to make something. And that for me has come from like curatorial projects, but mm. also projects where I'm just working with other artists to make things or, you know, where it's kind of more like a collaborative creative process. I think it's really healthy for artists to get outside of their own heads mm. as much as possible. We spend a lot of time by ourselves in our yeah. heads. And, and similarly, you do a lot of sort of off-site projects as well, where there must be a different relationship between you then curating objects and the dialogue around them in a space that isn't your gallery. Yeah, I mean, it depends really, um, I mean, I've done various different sort of off-site things, some that have been, um, I think, easier than others. I mean, mm -hmm. going back when, when sort of initially when the gallery was first opened where sort of parts of Hoxton and Shoreditch were being developed and I was given uh, sort of opportunities to work in kind of warehouse spaces which was great in one direction in that it, it was suddenly you know big space mm -hmm. um, but the you know with with practical um, you know practical problems involved because um, while it was I think a lot more relaxed you know in the 90s to early 2000s in terms of Things like public liability and stuff like that. That um, that um, you are in essence responsible for. Uh, you know, I mean, I can remember going round a sort of semi derelict warehouse after all my staff had left, <laughs> drunk in the night after a private view that we'd hosted for I don't know two hundred people, and I can remember going round this building with a torch, making sure nobody had fallen down. <laughs> <laughs> the lift shaft and whatever, and it, it, it that sense that you know it's all so glamorous that there's about you know 30 seconds of glamour, yeah, um, right. and the rest of the time it's it's I mean, it's a very interesting activity. I feel what I do because through it, I literally have interfaced with um, sort of every extreme, it feels yeah. like. And I mean every extreme, because galleries, I mean, I, the first gallery I worked um, in was um, off Charlotte Street and had the sort of door that you could come straight in from the street. So we, you know, we did interface with people who were sleeping on the street yeah. and coming in for shelter and sort of um, to, you know, major, major collectors and everybody in between mm. and I think that the interesting thing about art is that actually if you're interested in it 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 breaks down barriers in a way that nothing mm. else can and um, the um, you know I was thinking the other day somebody asked me about what my most um, successful sales were over a period of time, and I thought it was quite an interesting question because it 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 could be, you know, 
institutional sales that you've spent years working to get whatever it is, you know, to somewhere like the Tate, or um, those moments that don't happen that often, but they do occasionally. I, mean, I remember the beginning of an art fair, it's happened once to me at an art fair, where on the opening night I was standing on my stand and I had three different people come at the same time and they were literally going, I want that one, that one, that one, that one, and we'd, in three quarters of an hour, sold the whole stand, mm. which had never ever happened and never happened again, um, to actually, I think, actually, to me, some of the most successful sales have been selling something to somebody who's never bought a piece of artwork yeah. before, who, uh, I mean, I remember a young woman who years ago um, had made a, a, you know, she she wanted to buy something and she made a deal that she was going to come once a month for 10 months and she arrived religiously on the sort of Saturday morning of the beginning of the month and literally, this is in the days we used cash, you know, she'd been counting out however much money it was, was the deal. And at the same time, I'd made a very big sale to Goldman Sachs Bank. Um, and the difference that Goldman Sachs Bank took three VAT quarters to pay for work that had left the gallery, been shipped off to America, whatever. As this woman came in with her sort of bashed up five pound notes and you think, yeah, the one thing is meant to be the, oh, we've just sold all these paintings to Goldman Sachs, but actually had no advantage whatsoever yeah. at all. And then this other person who clearly was just totally invested in this thing that um, she she bought. And that's the side of what I do every so often. You see the kind of connection that somebody mm. makes with some, something. And it is tremendously satisfying um, that it, it feels like, yeah, you remember why, um, why you're doing why it you do in it. a way. Yeah. And I think the work I've done with people like hospital rooms or work that has a more sort of public face, although I love making paintings on canvas and that's like the, the basis of everything I do, is when you see real people connect with it, that, that reminds you of the power of art, you know, like mm. it's, it can change people's lives mm. without sounding like a pretentious wanker. It, like it really can, mm. and that's like a kind of magical thing that any of us can have mm. in our lives. You know, I'm very grateful to be able to, to, to work doing a doing something I really love, but also that there is that power to connect with other people mm. in a way that you probably wouldn't do in other ways. No, well, that's also something, again, I think that can get very lost in the art world, is yeah. that actually what, what we are involved with, it's about communication. Mm -hmm. That's the most sort of basic level. Um, and um, I think, you know, a lot, a lot has happened in the past 25 years, I think, that has made it um, less a kind of niche middle class sort of activity um, and I think probably will continue in that in that sense except that probably it's only going to be not even the middle class but <laughs> to a small proportion of very very rich people that will um, end up being you know the Medici's of you know once again of the future yeah um,